Welcome to the This Is Horror podcast. I'm your host, Michael David Wilson, and today we are going to be rejoining Laird Baron for the third and final part of our conversation. If you missed part one and part two, all you need to do is head back to episodes 188 and 189. But, as is the case with most This Is Horror podcasts, you can really listen to the conversation in any order. So, have a look at the topics and choose the podcast that most suits you. Before I get into the interview, let's have a quick word from our sponsors. First sponsor is Audible. And you can get a free 30-day trial. All you need to do is head on over to www.audibletrial.com forward slash this is horror. So many titles to choose from. The one that I recommend to you this week is Closing Time by Jack Ketchum. This is a fantastic short story collection by Jack Ketchum. It features stories that are primarily to do with loss and bereavement and death and it's absolutely fantastic so that is closing time by jack ketchum do you like stephen king do you like podcasts of stephen king do you like spooky magazines good news now you can have a stephen king podcast castle rock radio and you can have a spooky magazine dark moon digest all you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day. Okay, and with that said, let's do it. Let's get to part three of our conversation with Mr. Laird Barron. And now for our horror interview. So let's look then the next Patreon question. So, J.W. Donnelly says, The Imago sequence turned me on to modern horror and weird fiction, and since reading that collection and your other work, you've become my number one favourite writer. Anyway, my question... Where do you come up with your ideas normally, and how do you develop those ideas into stories? Well, I, GW, I really appreciate the kind words. It's really kind. Um, you know, I try to, and I kind of stole this from John Langan, and he has caught to the fact that he stole it from somebody else. But I was sitting in a class one time, uh, sort of auditing his class, uh, he was teaching creative writing at the university there, and he was talking to the students about don't, you know, you're in training, and part and part of it is you're you're training your imagination, you know, like you would a, a muscle. We, we had talked about that a lot. I don't, I don't differentiate uh, between the the mind and the body when it comes to developing endurance or strength or feats of you know feats of power. Uh, there's there's a lot of similarities there to how you develop that, and you know you're only limited by your nascent you know nascent ability. But he said you know you need to you need to basically train your train you have to train your imagination to be limber and responsive. Uh, he says like a puppy when a puppy first comes into your life they have a tendency to just everything is bright and shiny and it's it's new and it's exciting. And they don't really place more weight on one thing over another. And so there's a little bit of a training process, which what you have to be careful about is being too strict, it being too uh, you know, too much stick and not enough carrot. The bottom line is that puppy brings you your slippers and you're like, Yay, but then he brings you, you know, an old turd. And you're like, oh, and you get you get mad at him. The bottom line is you have to basically just sort of take everything with some equanimity. You have to say, Oh, well, thank you, thank you. And your subconscious is like that. It's constantly bringing you ideas, especially when you're young. And you kind of beat it down uh, over time. Uh, you kind of, you know, you or I should, you know, you basically you reject it. Is kind of what I'm getting at. Is you no, not that. And I really took that to heart. He said, you know, you have to basically just sort of be 
you have to be, you know, you have to have some sort of critical discrimination about what you actually work on. But your initial reaction to having these crazy ideas brought to you should be, wow, wonderful. What could I do with that? And I guess that does tie into the, you know, I'm the curmudgeon in our relationship. And he's the one going, that would have been a great movie if like these 40 things were changed. And I'm like, fuck off. No. But, you know, that's him in action, basically rewarding his imagination. You know, even in dire circumstances, he's, you know, making the best of it. And so I've tried to, in as much as my personality allows me to, just basically give my subconscious free or, or lower consciousness free reign at all times. So I, I'm constantly coming up with ideas, no matter where I am or what I'm doing. You know, a lot of people read on the bus or the subway or the tra- I, I, I watch people, you know, or if there's a movie on, I might passively ingest that and come up with something. But I'm I'm much more interested in what's going on around me and trying to figure out what I can do with it. And I don't put any pressure on myself. I just I'm an open I'm an open receiver. You go ahead, just you know, I absorb things. And, you know, I've, I've trained myself to the point where I discard things that I know aren't right for me. I shelve things that might be right for me. And I, immediate, and, I, and I store at the very top, you know, the very surface, I store things that might require immediate attention. And so that's one answer for how I get my ideas and how I develop them. The, the things that require my immediate attention, I almost always will write a paragraph, uh, whether it's a scene you know, like an exposition or whether it's dialogue, doesn't matter. You know, I'll write it down. Uh, and then p- perhaps I'll use it, perhaps I won't, but it's there. I don't forget it. The other source for my uh, stories is uh, I have a lot of bad dreams. I've had, generally speaking, just terrible nightmares since I was a little kid. And I'll go months without consciously experiencing them. But then I'll go for weeks or months and have one, you know, two or three times a week. I'll have some vivid, horrible nightmare. Uh, and the vast majority of those are just an exercise and suffering. I don't really get anything consciously out of it. But I have written some of my stories, uh, some of my stories that, you know, that, that I think have done the have done the best critically or, or commercially uh, derived from terrible dreams the imago sequence is one um 30 uh, although i'm not sure really what what came first there whether the the nightmares came after i started writing it or whether they sort of generated it but imago sequence is one real, real strong example of i woke up at five in the morning after this terrible dream and uh you know started writing the novella yeah, well, based on your fiction, I certainly don't envy you your nightmares. <laughs> yeah, it's just, I think everybody has, they say, you know, we always have dreams, you just don't recall them. Yeah. And I think a lot of people have nightmares. It's just, for whatever reason, you know, I just, and I and I do differentiate. I've had regular, night, what I consider just regular bad dreams many times. You, know, you wake up, you're like, oh, that was horrible. But for whatever reason... From the time I was four or five, I, maybe even younger, I just frequently, relatively frequently, I will I suffer these like hellish dreams. They're just uh, and they're about all different things. You know, they're not they're not always about one thing or another. And 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 uh, you know, I, I've just tried to make make something positive out out of it. It's not like I. It's not like a living hell. I, it doesn't happen every night. It's just often enough that. Uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's kind of a fact of life for me, but you know, I, I've been able to do something with it. So there's, you know, if I never have another one, I'm not going to cry, but, um, some good has come of it. Mm. Well, Brian Asman would like to know what were your top accomplishments from 2017 and what didn't go the way you wanted and what are your goals for 2018? It's that's an interesting question. When I was at Nikon, the, the uh, I was a guest of honor with Gemma Files and um, Weston Oaks, wonderful people, and wonderful convention. By the way, anybody listening, it's just a, one of my favorite conventions I've ever been to. And um, they asked that question. It was kind of tough on me at the time. 
but and it's going to sound kind of odd because people aren't expecting a non-literary response but i think my biggest accomplishment uh, of 2017 was i kind of i have to say i kept my dog alive that was um, that was a, a big part of my year uh, this has been the longest year second maybe second longest year i've ever experienced and a variety of reasons i had some minor health problems throughout the year, stress probably related, but my dog, who's, uh, her name's Athena and she's, I've had her since she was about six weeks old, just when she was just a little ball of fluff. And <clears throat> she has been my constant companion for, well, over 15 years now. And, you know, she's getting old and I, judging from how she staggers around and she's lost her hearing and whatnot, you know, I, our days are numbered, but this summer, uh, she just, you know, she was actually doing pretty well and, uh, you know, still running around the yard and whatnot, like a younger dog. And she just started having seizures and they were horrible. They were the kind that shake the house. They were grand mall, you know, she like tearing the carpet up. And I, that was really difficult to deal with, um, to see her, to see that happening. And we did a, uh, medical procedure that cost many thousands of dollars and they said you know it was 50 50 chance and it worked but she was basically in sort of a semi-coma for about three weeks and you know all i did i wasn't able to write really uh i wasn't able to do anything but pick up my 70 pound dog and have to carry her outside every couple hours and i fed her with a perky baster and i mean she literally was only awake a few minutes a day for the first three weeks and you know she came out of it uh I got very sick from dealing with it, but she, she came out of it. She's still an old dog. Her days are still limited, but she's here. And, uh, that was my, I literally willed her, you know, I willed her to, to come back if she wanted to, you know, my, my thing is I've always said about dogs, pets, you know, our job isn't to keep them alive as long as possible. It's to make, it's to be their stewards and to provide them as as happy a life as you can. And if, if it was a situation where I thought that she was in pain or it was just her time, then I would have, I would have let her go, but she wanted to live. And, uh, you know, I worked really hard to, you know, to make sure it happened. And I have to say that was, uh, you know, on a, on a human level, you know, on a, how you feel about things probably on your deathbed. It was, didn't pay any bills and it actually kind of kind of screwed me over in a lot of ways monetarily, but it, and it really delayed things. Um, luckily my, luckily my, my publisher was really understanding and they gave me an extension, you know, to, to write the novel, the second novel and all that, because I just, I lost all that time. I, I could not, you know, create. Um, but I really feel though that, you know, on my deathbed, I'm not going to be like, Oh, I wrote X amount of novels. I'm going to be like, you know, my dog got another year. And so that was my biggest, my biggest accomplishment. Um, pretty close on its heels is despite all that, I wrote the novel. Uh, I'm really happy with it. We'll see what we'll see what my publisher thinks because we still have to edit it and all that. But you know, I did it. I I I got up off the canvas and I wrote the damn thing. And not only did I write it, but I took great pride in it when I was done with it. Uh, I feel like I'm finally learning how to write novels, possibly. And so that was a you know, kind of a tandem thing. I really felt like that was a huge accomplishment that despite being in the situation I was, that I got that done. The things that I really regret, I had to cancel on several anthologies that I wanted to be in uh, with, you know, uh, and I really feel, I feel bad. I feel bad about that. I just couldn't, it just came to the point and I've never been there before where I just, I literally could not uh, do all of the stuff that I had planned on doing. And so I had to, I basically, I had to bail on some things. And so that would be my biggest, uh, my biggest regret and my biggest failure of the year. Uh, as far as 2018, uh, I just wrapped up, I just wrapped up the, uh, book two in the Coleridge series. I'm sure I'll be doing plenty of, of work on that because, you know, uh, there's always, there's always stuff to be done during the editing process. Uh, but I plan on, uh, writing half a dozen, uh, short fiction pieces, a couple of novella or one novella, uh, a novelette, and then probably four, three or four, um, shorter pieces for various anthologies. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I think the moment that you went through with your dog, I mean, it's things like that that really put into perspective what it is to be human and what's important in life. Yeah, I have to... And this is something I don't know if I even I said this. I, it was really emotional for me when in July when I was talking about this. It was really difficult. Still is very difficult. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was so difficult that I got, I mean, I was violently ill afterward. For you know, I had Lyme disease and other things. You know, I just, I, I remember this from when I raced dogs. You can put so much of yourself into something that you just, you literally will become physically sick after the, after the crisis has passed. And I was very sick for about three months. So basically from August through into October, I was pretty damn sick. Uh, but I, I really have to give credit to my girlfriend because she, you know, first of all, I wouldn't be able to. If people pay lip services. Oh, if it wasn't for my wife or my girlfriend. Now my girlfriend really makes, uh, Jessica really makes it possible for me to do things at the level that I'm able to do them. I would write no matter what. You put me in a prison cell, I'll be writing. But she allows me to write and helps me write in a way that uh, gets me as close to my perfect self as I can be when it comes to doing this. And she was there when I had to make that decision about the dog because they said, Hey, she's probably going to die. You know, and it was more money than I had, et cetera. And she looked at me and she goes, that's what credit cards are for. You, you put, the, you put it on the credit card and you don't, you don't even think twice. And think, goodness I did because you know it's been eight months now and the dog has had eight months of wonderful yeah relatively speaking wonderful life so I got I just want to say that publicly if in case I neglected to when I was in when I was in um, Providence or not Providence I forget where we were but when I was up north the bottom line is is uh, she she really made sure that I made the right decision so yeah that's just fantastic to have such a supportive girlfriend there for you and to help you get through that yeah because i wasn't saying mm-hmm. irrational what was going on i don't know how you can be no i was calm but I, I was calm but i wasn't rational and she was very rational so anyway you know and i'm looking at 2018 and i think 2018 is going to be great basically the first half of the year is short fiction and and whatever edits uh are, i'm called upon to make in the novel and then the second half i plan on writing another novel so I'm going to be, uh, you know, as busy as ever. Yeah. And that novella and novelette that you mentioned, are they part of a larger publication or are those going to be standalones? Uh, Larger publications. Yeah, And and I should, I should, you know, also make the point that I'm just submitting them. I've been invited. It doesn't mean that they'll take them, but, um, yeah, they're they're part of antho- you know uh, anthologies and whatnot. Mm. So and and one of them's a Jessica for anybody's interested. One of them's a sequel, kind of in a roundabout way to Andy Kaufman, Creeping Through the Trees. Uh, it takes place a few months after that, and then the rest of them are. I intend to write them. Uh, I have a Baroque fantasy setting, you know, Fritz Leiber, Moorcock. Um, you know, Roger Zelazny esque that kind of stuff. I uh, I have a few stories that I that I'm working on in that in that universe. So uh, that's what I'm that's what I'm doing. Well, you've unintentionally really helped with a segue that I'm about to make now because Brandon Petri via Patreon says, "Can you speak a little bit about the writing of your short story?" Andy Kaufman creeping through the trees. Specifically, why Andy Kaufman? I think you mentioned in an interview that you might have another story or stories connected to that one in the works. I've read that story a handful of times and it still creeps up on me. Well, most of my stories, and it's funny, even the crime novel, uh, they're all part of this sort of interlinked, not interlinked stories, but like, you know, they're part of the same universe or, or as I like to say, I have two universes and possibly a third now that I'm working on the the secondary fantasy stuff. But so all my stories are really connected anyway, but as far as like explicitly connected, um, Andy Kaufman, he popped up, uh, in termination, termination dust. He was mentioned 
and the king of pop. I never said Michael Jackson, and I'm not going to say it was Michael Jackson, but one of the one of the victims in the story of the sheriff was, uh, you know, he hallucinated uh, Michael Jackson, and I was riffing on. I even I I mentioned it in that story, Termination Dust, which came out. Ross Lockhart published it in his Jack the Ripper anthology a few years ago. You know, I mentioned that there's a movie called um, that many I think many listeners will have will have seen it as uh, True Romance with Christian Slater and uh, a few or uh, Arquette. Uh, and one of the things about the main character Clarence is that he kept hallucinating Elvis. You never saw Elvis's face. But whenever he would have a crisis, should I go out there and shoot everybody or should I run? You know, Elvis would go, I like you, Clarence. Let me tell you what you should do. <laughs> you know, and they don't, it's, it's, it's important, but it's not like the point of the movie. And I thought, you know, mm. I like that. Talk, you know, there's a piece of found art, right? That's something that I directly, I like, sometimes I'll take something out of pop culture, but I tried to be careful and say, Hey, this is where the idea came from. I didn't just like toss it in. It was like the sheriff as he's, you know, hallucinating the guy michael jackson he thought he had a brain tumor or something but he goes why couldn't it be somebody cool like elvis you know i didn't want michael he's not into you know modern pop type of thing so i i tried to make make the connection obvious for people who might not otherwise know but uh i kind of had this idea though the reason i even used it is that it's really vague i don't want to give away too much of the magic but basically the idea that that there are things out there that look like celebrities, you know the, the idea, the old Rakshasa idea, the old Indian legend, you know, East Indian legend about, um, you know, the creature that that stalks the byways and it looks like somebody that you know type of thing. I always liked that legend. Night Stalker did an episode on it back in the seventies, and that really uh, influenced me as a kid. It scared me, in other words. And uh, I just like the idea that, you know, there's a, there's a line in, I can't remember if it was in Termination Dust or Andy, I think it was Andy Kaufman, where he says, you know, and if you, would older people, would it be Andy Griffith, you know, that was haunting you? Or would it be, would it be Benjamin Franklin? You know, would it be somebody, if you were farther back in time, you know, who would the celebrity be? And I, I just, I liked that. As for why Andy Kaufman, I think the answer would be why not? I mean, Andy Kaufman was a creepy intentionally creepy his whole his whole shtick was was dread and disquiet i'm not joking why are you laughing i'm not joking you know and he, he and he had this very flat affect mm. and the way that the light glinted in his eyes he's i think i think he's kind of a boogeyman figure uh his his maybe not as a real person but his his stage persona and then of course he pretended to be uh you know he played the part of uh tony clifton and then after he died Others have played Tony Clifton, but no one will ever take credit for playing Tony Clif- Clifton. They try to pretend that Tony Clifton's a real person. Yeah, and it's po- and it's possible that there is a Tony Clifton, and that sometimes it was Tony Clifton, but that more recently it's been uh, his old uh, Andy Kaufman's old manager. Like I forget the guy's name, uh, Zappa Bob Zamuda. Zamuda, Zamuda, that's who it is. Right, yeah. and so I I just said, you know, that is rich. That is such a and it's such a weird angle. It's something Brian Evanson or, 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 or Stephen Graham Jones would do, so I'm doing it because they haven't yeah. done it. I'll do it. And so I did it, and it, uh, and that's, and that's kind of what you that, – that, that's why that uh, – why you've got that. I just think that Andy Kaufman may not be spooky to the average person, younger person picking it up today, the story. But anybody my age, I think, will either laugh at it and go, what? Or, but at least they'll know. But I think a lot I, I, from the feedback I've received. Oh my god, yeah, yeah, I can see him being creepy. So mission accomplished, as far as I'm concerned. Well, Andy Kaufman was such an enigma that much like Elvis. I mean, there are still people who are adamant that Andy Kaufman isn't dead; that he faked his own death, and there are all sorts of conspiracies oh. surrounding him and his legend. Absolutely, I, I alluded to that in Termination Dust. You know, he's been alive and killing people, cutting throats since '84. One of the reasons that I use Kaufman also is because you, you hit it, Enigma. The story is an is a very enigmatic story, and the idea is that you never really know what's going on in the story. At the end, it kind of shoves you in a direction, but it's still it's still there's some there's some questions there, but. That's simply reflective of Andy Kaufman's persona. You never really knew what was going on. 
with him. You could never, you were always off balance with him. And I thought, you know, what a great metaphor. Just what a great metaphor. Cause I didn't want to do a story where he's running around hacking people up or his doppelgangers and, you know, running around murdering people. I want it to be, you don't know why you're scared. I was scared writing it. I was disquieted writing it. I was disquieted whenever I watched him do his stand up, and I wanted to, as, as best I'm able to basically convey that in a horror story. Why is it a horror story? Well, up until the last page or two, you don't know why, but but it is. It is this. It's a weird, very uh, unset. For me, it was really unsettling. The experience was unsettling. And it's because Andy Kaufman's unsettling. I think is, is the biggest. You know, and, the, and of course, the joke is Andy Kaufman isn't even in the story. His character is Tony Clifton's in it. Which is just another layer, and of course Steely, Steely, Steely J, who we all know and who we all know and love, but because uh, the, the, Ste- uh, Steely J is simply a, uh, an ongoing. I won't say a joke because it's not a joke by any means. I'm really proud of them. But Justin Steele paid to be uh, Tuckerized a few years ago. I think it was the Alan Datlow anthology when they were kickstarting it. I think it was. Um, can't think of the title around oh uh fearful symmetries and i believe that was the one where i had offered to tuckerize somebody for you know you could buy that and so i i, I told him i would i would go not only put him in a story i put him in a few i'd create a character and put the character in a few stories mm-hmm. well the story was just perfect and it's it's one of my favorites and everything you're talking about man i, I grew up watching Andy kaufman and it for a lot of, I try to turn people on to him and they just couldn't get it. And it's, it, it's one of those things that, you know, and I'd say, look, man, it's real simple. It's not really, he's not really a comedian. It's a performance already. It's he's, yes, he's there to destroy your perception of what you think entertainment is. That's right. And he is fortunate enough to where he is getting to do whatever the fuck he wants to do because your laughs aren't important. As long as he thinks it's funny, that's all that matters. Yeah. You know, the joke's on us. So, but yeah, I mean, I even think that watching, you know, man on the moon yeah. is, uh, it, it, it can't, it, it, that can't be the, the actual real version of, of, you know, of Andy Kaufman. I think that even, you know, Melos Foreman was probably just fucking with us. You know, there, there's there's some definite history there. They hit the high notes, but there's some behind the scenes stuff that almost seemed like, man, it seemed like Andy was kind of guiding them through it, you know. <laughs> and it's, I don't know. Like I said, I grew up, I grew up watching him and uh, he's, he's, he's one of my favorite, you know, favorite performers. He's, he definitely had an impact on me and when i wrote you know obviously he's been gone for many many years and uh i don't sit around watching andy kaufman but in preparation for the story and while i was writing the story i mainlined andy kaufman as much as i could on youtube and you know anything i could find with him in it Uh, specifically when he was doing out at supposedly out of character stuff i watched his interviews the whole Memphis, you know, where he, where he had the whole running feud allegedly with, you know, the wrestler, yeah. the whole thing, uh, his appearances mm-hmm. on the tonight show, you name it. The ones where he hosted, he hosted a comedy show where, and, and Tony Clifton, you know, and Tony Clifton comes out. So obviously somebody else was playing him at the time. I, it, yeah, it was an unsettling, powerful, pretty powerful experience to be honest. And, uh, I actually want to watch, there's a special, uh, like a like a quasi documentary that is about Man on the Moon. Uh, yeah. Right. You guys know what I'm talking about. That's coming out. Oh right yeah, now. it's on Netflix. G- Jim yeah, and Andy, watch, watch The that. Great Beyond. Yeah. Yeah, mm. I want to see that. So, yeah, good question though. That's a. I'm I'm very you know I gotta admit I'm I'm proud of that story and uh, but I have to give for any success I had in it I have to give a lot of credit to the subject matter because it it kind of it lent itself. To, you know, to, to write, to basically write that story. It, it really wasn't as hard as it sometimes is for me. I felt like, I felt like Andy Kaufman, even though the story isn't about Andy Kaufman, that's the thing. It, he's really not in it much. Even Tony Clifton's not in it much, but, but the very fact, the very weight of Kaufman in our universe was so heavy on my mind when I was writing that it just, I was able to basically create something that, was in basically influenced, you know, or uh, informed by what I 
what I thought I, you know, my experience with watching him. And so I'm, uh, I'm glad I had the idea to do it. Yeah. I think after this podcast, I want to go and rewatch a load of Andy Kaufman now. Well, the next question is from Andrew M. Reichart. And this is, this is quite a long question, but here we go. As much as I love the eerie uncertainty that typifies weird fiction, I really love what's oh so gradually revealed about the origin and nature of the children of Old Leech. And even though there's a faint disappointment that accompanies the ultimate revelation and explanation, I found that knowledge enhances my reread of Leech stories rather than detracting from it. I know there's plenty else that remains to be revealed about your universes, though, and I'm curious whether there's more coming about how things tie together. In particular, I've heard you say something about there being two main intersecting parallel worlds in play here, which we get a direct glimpse of in Parallax. Are we going to get any more concrete clarity about your cosmology anytime soon? aside from Old Leech. And though I've read almost all your fiction and many interviews, if there's stuff I've missed about this sort of thing, is there anything in particular I should check out about this that might give me even more clarity or some tantalizing confusion? <laughs> I like the tantalizing confusion because <laughs> I think that's, I actually think that's, I mean, that's a, that's a great question and I really like that kernel at the end because I think that in a way encapsulates what I'm trying to do right I don't want things in my universe to match up perfectly uh, or universes I thought about that for a while I actually sat down a couple of years ago because I actually do not write a huge I do keep some character bibles but I really not much a lot of this stuff I just I just re remember it but it's getting bigger and bigger and more unwieldy. And I actually sat down and said, okay, where do these universes, mer you know, where do they intersect? What stories are in what universe? And what I realized after I actually went through and I, you know, some, it doesn't matter. Some, some are, are vague enough that I'm like, ah, they could be in either one, but there's a few, quite a few, 25, 30 of them that could, you know, you, you have to, you don't have to, but, but I, I tend to want to place in one reality or the other. But one thing I figured out, and this goes back to the tantalizing confusion, that kind of warps in the weave, flaws in the or flaws in the in the weave are actually more incongruities are more interesting ultimately than nope, this is where this lines up and that's where that lines up. I think in other words, it's good for some of them to line up neatly so that you can demonstrate, no, no, this is intentional, this is what I'm trying to do. But I think some of them by necessity, and I've been working on this, no, they have to be contradictory to some degree. They have to be, wait a minute, didn't he say that, well, maybe it's in the other universe, but no, it doesn't make sense if it's there either. Good. To a certain degree, the very essence of the weird, and this is the weird aspect, not the horror aspect, is that it doesn't always conform to what, you, you want to basically be holding your head going, wait a minute, how does that, I can almost make it fit. Like, if it's an obvious error, that's one problem. You don't want that. But if it's just like it, it wants to fit, but it's not quite fitting, am I missing something? Perfect. That's perfect. Because I think that it lends the work, the, mis the mystery of it lends the work more power. More power for me writing it, but also just the enjoyment of it. I don't, we don't want the answers to all this stuff. Uh, it, that leads into another part of his question, you know, like, or at least a statement that he made, you know, where, uh, having the old leech, you know, or excuse me, having the children of old leech sort of explained in more detail. And I think he's referring to the croning. You know, I've been dealing with this question ever since hallucinogenia way back in Imago sequence. I get to the climactic scene uh, where Wallace, the protagonist, wanders into this room and his wife, something's happened to his wife, something cosmic, horror-oriented and monstrous. Do you show it or do you explicitly show it or do you show a reaction shot or do you do something in the middle and stephen king you know font of wisdom uh had said something to the effect of you know 
there's something behind the door and so you you always are faced with the eternal question of do you show it or not once you show it though it doesn't really matter whether it's five feet tall or 500 feet tall you you know oh it's it's this you've quantified it but the problem is is you can't especially if you're planning on long term if you're going to do tons of stories and novels and stuff and have a, and actually have a career you're you can't just write you can't you, you basically can't just pick one and say that's what i'm always going to do it's creatively stifling and it's it's stifling for the audience the audience should not be able to know, you know the audience should have some kind of mystery about what they're going to get uh, in as much as you can provide it to them and so a lot of these stories you know i am i'm confronted with how much do i tell and it's possible i aired maybe i maybe i maybe i explained too much about the children of old leech i certainly don't plan on like laying bare the secrets of it any time in the near future. Now, as far as uh, continuity stories, I, I have said in the past, that, oh, I think maybe I'm moving away from cosmic horror. I don't think that's true anymore. I, I, I kind of reserve the right to change my mind on that. I think at the time that I said it, which was probably six, seven years ago, yes, I was a full-time writer, but I kind of envisioned my career unfolding differently. And, and the reality of it is I've actually done a lot more writing in the last few years. And so I find that I can do I can do more things, so I don't really need to say, "Well, I'm only going to be a crime writer now," because I keep seeing that. Oh, I guess he's just done with with horror. He's going to write crime. No, you know, I may I may have to take a break from other things and concentrate on on building the series or whatever. But I don't I I, I cannot imagine not you know writing more uh, horror fiction, whether it's long or short. So I, I'm going to do more. It's just that uh, I, I I don't know when, and I don't know precisely how it's going to unfold but i think a lot of it uh, is going to unfold in the secondary universe because a lot almost all the characters in the secondary universe are characters from the the collections that i've already written they're just in a different they're just in a different format or a different uh, iteration of themselves no i agree with you 100 percent about you know what he's talking about about revelations and things like that if you when you define something, you remove its mystery. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I, I've, I, I used to in a lot of my early stories, I tried to to, to define it because I thought that was how it was going to be scary. And it took me a long time to realize that if I if I don't define it, but I still try to give my characters some type of closure uh, to whatever degree that they can experience that then that's that's good enough for me uh you know some people say well that's that you're not writing weird fiction you're writing you know quiet horror nah not necessarily uh you know you you want you want to show something but there has to be an air of mystery about it and it's it those it lingers in the mind and that's what makes the story memorable because you, you you don't know. It didn't answer all the questions. It gave you more questions. And that's that's what you know, that's one of the things I love about your writing and most you know, most of the good weird fiction that's out that's out there is that, that it always has there's always more questions. Well, I no, I, I agree and I, I think a story just has to the pro, here's the problem. Cause I can say, you know, sort of definitively what I think about story A as an artifact the problem it the problem for me comes into play and why it's becoming more complicated uh is because my stuff no longer exists in an episodic fashion or in a vacuum all my stuff and for many years now it's been I mean, since the first collection it's pretty much been this way every time i write a story i've made the decision that they essentially link together and it even like i said even with stories that aren't you know i plan on, on trying to forge new directions down the road uh, I don't want everything to always be like, well, there's always connections that you can visibly detect. But the bottom line is you're always competing with yourself and you're always sort of you're in, you're in dialogue with other authors that have come before you or maybe doing work, you know, c contemporaneous work. But but you really you start being judged by yourself, uh, whether you whether you're judging or whether your readers are critics are everything gets compared to what you've done before. And you just there are so many hurdles to overcome. Did I say this? Did I, you know, to repeat myself, I, my experience so far after having written two crime novels, a very short novel, and then the croning is that I prefer writing, uh, it, it, when it comes to ease, I'd rather write novels. There's, there's a lot less to worry about uh, in, in some ways, trying to put stories together for collections 
is an enormous, you know, like you have a dozen stories, it's 12 beginnings, middles and ends. And then you have to, and then you have to make them all, even if you don't want them to tie in together, like if you're just doing kind of an unthemed collection, you still have to make sure that they're not too similar, that you didn't have similar, you know, you don't stumble over, wow, I've used that, I've used that expression so many times. In a novel, you just do a search and replace, but stories that have been written years apart, you literally, to make them work in a collection, if you weren't careful, you may have to even rewrite them so that they work together. And I, so I have a tendency to not necessarily prefer novels by any means. I'm a, I love short stories, but I'm starting to think that, uh, for me anyway, that writing the novels is actually in some ways less onerous. I can see where it comes in, into play because it's a self-contained entity uh, that's probably a little bit more manageable than, say, you know, half a dozen or a dozen short stories. That makes perfect yeah. sense. You know, it's more wordage, but that's never been a, a problem. It's it's one beginning, one middle, one end. Uh, when I I don't write my collections as uh, episodic pieces. I my collections have always been. I treat them like a novel, and that's a hard way to. I'm just. I'm going to tell you. It, I mean, not to lecture or preach the choir, but it's a hard way to write a novel. To to, to basically do a mosaic novel like Swift to Chase. That it's always hard because I, I try to push myself as hard as I can anyway. But just the logistics, if you're just looking at logistics, that that was infinitely more difficult than writing the, the, the two Coleridge novels by itself. So Eric Sparkman would like to know, how much of your writing style would you say can be attributed to your life in Alaska and how much was influenced by other writers and which writers had the most impact and in what way? So I appreciate that is three questions in one. Good questions. Alaska, uh, I've said this before, and I don't want to, I don't want to basically say, oh, Alaska is primacy in this regard. Because I honestly think if you grew up in certain parts of Texas or Wyoming or wherever, anywhere where there's a powerful, extreme or dramatic geographical kind of presence, uh, I'm sure that I would find kindred spirits. But Alaska has a personality. And I say this as somebody who, maybe I'm spiritual, but I'm not particularly, I'm not a, I'm definitely not a religious and I'm not, you know, a new age uh, uh, pagan or anything like that. I just, I do believe though that, uh, you know, biosystems have, have a presence. And <clears throat> whether it's rock, predominantly rock, or whether it's, the wilderness, uh, you know, the woods, uh, the ocean, the sea, I should say, actually, um, that basically th there is some sort of, I think, unconscious sort of s sort of personality, for want of a better term. And Alaska left its mark on me. I would say I was, I was scarified by Alaska, particularly because of how I, my interactions with, with it. I've almost, you know, I almost died several times, uh, twice that conclusively, I don't know how I survived, but, um, and, and that has, that had an effect on me. I also think there's a low level inimical sort of undercurrent to Alaska. It doesn't, it doesn't want us around. Uh, it doesn't want man, it doesn't want people around. And I, I think the closest I've come to, to making an analogy about that is when I was a little kid, I had cancer and I lost my right eye. Uh, I was about a year and a half old and, they created a uh, prosthetic composite plastic looks just like a real eye, but your body does not appreciate having a foreign object in the, you know, in it. And so the first few years that I had the eye, especially the first few months, I remember this clearly, even as a baby, uh, my face would swell up and my body would try to reject it. I'd get headaches I'd scream. I'd cry, I'd hide the thing. You know, and it was worth like I think around three grand back in 1972. So you can imagine how much that, how expensive that thing was. Long story short, is I feel like Alaska. There's this weird parallel there that Alaska. It's not like there's some kind of great spirit trying to reject us. And it's not what I believe, but I do believe that it's a biosystem and it wants, basically, it wants that composite plastic bullshit out of it. It wants us and our bullshit out of it, and whether that means freezing you to death in a storm or you're eaten by something or whether you just, you know, uh, 
you know, just suffer from madness. So many people go crazy up there. I think that there's something, something to it. And I think that it had a huge impact just as much as how I was raised. I think where I was raised, uh, it was very important. And then when I went to the Pacific Northwest and really got my career going, it's beautiful and majestic. You step outside of Olympia, the capital, and you're in the woods. And there's the Cascades and the the Olympic Peninsula and all that stuff. It's a softer, gentler, but no less inimical version of Alaska. It's just, it's just, just it seems like it's a lower key there. And I was able to kind of look at the compare and contrast those things. And and I wrote a lot of my early stories uh, in that region, and specifically because I was able to compare it to my experiences in Alaska, not as a you're not as a poor person trying to survive, but just like my experiences with the wilderness itself, just, you know, venturing out into the great outdoors. How are they similar? How are they different? And that comparison and, and, and contrast was the genesis of a lot of ideas and a lot of the personality of my first two or three, well, three, three collections. You said you almost died twice in Alaska. So it was the first time the cancer where you lost your right eye or is this another? no so this no. is two further traumatic events oh yeah you know i the funny thing is i i actually have reined it in over the years because i started talking about all the stuff that happened i'm like it, it's just not believable i mean it's just so much stuff happened it's just it really just kind of beggars uh you know uh, credulity but you know, really dramatic things I can share. Yeah, uh, cancer. I got, Basically, I was in, uh, we had left Alaska for just a few months. My dad wanted to go to Oregon and go logging or whatever. So we were in Oregon and they realized I had cancer. So that's, I was in Portland and uh, that's where the operation took place. And then, we, and then we moved back. But yeah, I had cancer. Uh, I probably had it at, while we were in Alaska, but it wasn't diagnosed until we were living in Portland. But um you no, know, the time, you know, a couple of the times I almost bought it in Alaska. One was, uh, I almost drowned when I was, a, when I was very young and, uh, I literally was sinking to the bottom of the Creek and my dad had to come in and get me and I was unconscious and he had to pump me out and all that. I, I don't think I required mouth to mouth, but he literally had to like dive underwater and find me and then drag me back. And then I remember him, you know, pouring the water out. I couldn't move. I couldn't do anything. And so that was one time. And then, um, and that really, that, I, I've had a phobia of uh, being submerged since then. It's been a real problem. Uh, the other more dramatic time was I got, uh, was racing the Iditarod in 1991. And you get close to the finish line up in Nome, and there's a series along the coast, these giant, just these giant hills. And um, the storm came in. I, I was told that, oh, I had, I had many hours, you know, the storm veered in it was hurricane force winds so the gusts were i mean mild but the gusts were up to like 80 miles an hour and uh it was the ambient temperature was i want to say 30 to 40 below you know on a if it was still so you can imagine with the with with the steady 30 to 40 knot wind and then with the gusts up you know in the 70s to 80s uh what that's like and i sim we simply got to the point where we couldn't like i couldn't proceed I couldn't even lead the dogs because the hills, you know, we were right by the water. I didn't, I got to where I didn't really know what direction anything was in. I couldn't see more than about four feet in front of me. And, um, so I piled all the dogs up. There was like one group of bushes that, you know, the, the kind that grow on the coast there that don't, you know, nothing will destroy them. They don't have, there was no leaves or anything. It was just this pile of brush and I stuck the dogs in it. And then I crawled, crawled into the sled bag and, uh, I was stuck there for 36 hours and I, froze my hand, I froze my face, I froze my right foot. Uh, when I say froze, I don't mean, free, you know, like uh, frostbite. I mean, I know I froze it. When I got to the finish line, they took me to the hospital. I was walking around with my shoe off. It took me a while to get my boot off. They actually, we, we almost had to cut the boot off. It was frozen onto my foot. So I get the boot off, and I'm walking around on a uh, tile floor, and it sounded like I was wearing uh, tap shoes. It was My foot was clacking on the ground. And so, yeah, that was, you know, I thought I was going to die. I actually, I thought we were all, you know, that was it. I had made complete peace with, we're not going to survive this. But we did. Yeah, that is. That's harrowing. Remarkable, yeah. Well, do you give me an idea how, it's hard to describe, but I had a, um, 
a signal with me. It was um, a beacon. And it's so bright. It's just a white beacon, you know, a blue-white light. It's so bright that if you look at it, it would literally it would sting your eyes like you looked at the sun. That's how bright it was. And so what happened is you have um, gear that you have. To, you Basically, you have gear that you have to haul. So when I was trying to get my team camped, I, I, I had an axe with me. And I was trying to... I was trying to, I can't remember what I was trying to chop the, I mean, I was literally getting knocked down. Every time a gust would hit, I would, I would, I would fall to the ground. So this is, that, that's how bad. You can't see, you can't hear. And I dropped the axe and the axe went, the gust picked it up and it just, it was like a two and a half pound axe. It's bigger than a hatchet, but it's not like a full size lumberjack axe. So it's like, you know, two and a half feet long and it's made out of metal. It had a rubber handle made out of metal. It, it just took off. It went end over end. The wind just took it. Well, you can't finish the race without an axe. And I wasn't coherent anyway. I should have just been like, uh. So I, I turned on the beacon. That was at least one smart thing I did. And I stuck it on the end of my sled. And it had like a little, you know, like a little carabiner clamp on it. So I just clamped it on the sled. So it's blowing around, but it's flashing and it's blinding. And I went out after the axe. And I found the axe. The axe wasn't like I saw it. It was just there. So I picked it up. I turned around and there was nothing. There was no beacon. There was nothing. There was just white. And so I start walking in the direction, right? Retrace my steps. And there's no steps to retrace because it's either bare ground or it's two, two to four feet of snow piled up. That's, that's how hard the wind's blowing. And so I, I walk back to where the sled is. And all of a sudden I see the beacon out of the corner of my eye, like 50 yards in, in a different direction than I was walking. I was walking in the general direction, but instead of walking back to it, I was definitely going to walk, you know, like, 70 degrees in the wrong wrong or 45 to 70 degrees in the wrong direction and so as i got closer this little faint flicker was this blinding strobe and i i don't think i had gone more than like 150 feet total 200 feet something like that so that was um you know it's it, here we talk about it's one thing but i it, it was uh you know i literally thought we were dead there was not even you, it was beyond fear. I wasn't even afraid. Like you get when you see a car in your lane or you're, you know, drowning when I was drowning that one time. No, I was way past all that. I was just at, by the time, you know, we were, we were stuck for 36 hours. I was just like, Oh, we're, we're going to die. I had a piece of chocolate in my mouth and I couldn't melt it. I found a piece of chocolate. So I put it in my mouth and, uh, I had to spit it out because I couldn't, I didn't have enough body temperature to, to even just do anything with it. So, you know, uh, I got, we got really lucky. Yeah, I I don't even know what to say. <laughs> we we can't end on that note. No, <laughs> we're not we're not going to. <laughs> yeah, just have I mean, the, the bleakest podcast. What? Just fade out now and put the outro music <laughs> on. <laughs> That's it. Just have the the last few notes. You just have the last few notes from uh, "Wish You Were Here." Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is another one of those times where there's no way to neatly segue. But Brian Asman has another question. He says, What are some directions you think weird fiction might take over the coming years, and how do you see the genre evolving? Good question. I, I can't answer with any authority. Uh, my just educated guess. Trends, you know, the, it's always about trends. Uh, and, and sometimes there's multiple trends occurring. Uh, I'd say right now we're kind of at peak, if not on the, downs, on, on the downside of everything Lovecraft. You know, uh, I don't think Cosmic Horror necessarily has peaked. But it's possible that, you know, Lovecraft all the time, 24-7, may, uh, you know, may be waning slightly. Um, I, I still think it's probably going to remain popular as far as, like, you're going to see some anthologies. But uh, not like it was a couple years ago where every anthology seemed like it was a Lovecraft anthology. Now, not to say that it won't come back. I, I think that there's, there's going to be some enduring uh, interest in Lovecraft. But... Everything seems to be, you know, and it's hard to predict because pe what people write now get, doesn't get published till next year. And everybody that's writing, you know, is writing something that may be completely different will come out the year after. So that's really difficult. That's why they say never chase trends. 
like I, you know, I got away from, you know, I did my first three collections in the, in the very much the Lovecraftian vein. Well, Swift to Chase, which I had been working on for several years, you know, t- was to take me away from, away from that in anticipation that I wanted to get out in front of love the basically every, you know, the Lovecraft train crashing before it crashed essentially and be, and be well on to doing crime and horror that's much more hard boiled or not more hard boiled, but less Lovecrafty and inflected because I always reserve the right as we all do to come back and do it again later. I just, I feel like, but these are trends and you always want to be, if not setting a trend, you want to be in front of that as much as you can, if you want to keep writing and being, uh, you know, successful. So I don't know. I, I mean, I think over the next few years, you're going to, I actually, I'll just throw this out there. I think you're going to see more of a reflexive distancing from Lovecraft. I think there's a consequence to changing the world fantasy bust and, uh, you know, the dialogue that some people have been drag kicking and screaming into uh, the, some of the old guard types. Uh, but this necessary dialogue uh, is occurring. And I think there's going to be a consequence for that. I think you're going to have some people, by God, it's Lovecraft forever. And they're going to write Lovecraft. But I think a lot of people are going to either subvert Lovecraft as you've seen, you've already seen some of that with uh, Victor Laval and Caitlin Kiernan and, you know, others um, who are like, you know, I've been, I, I've been trying to subvert Lovecraft for years, but we're talking about in a really explicit way. Uh, and people who, who have a lot, a lot at stake uh, are, are going to be subverting Lovecraft. Victor Laval is a perfect example. He is taking it on, you know, he's, he's basically explicitly taking on Lovecraft, the, some of the racism inherent in Lovecraft's work. So I think what, what that's going to lead to, though, is that there's only so much of that that the market's going to bear. And that and artists, especially these great artists, they're, they're going to do so much of it and they're going to move on to other things. And I think people who have a strong interest, writers who have a strong interest in continuing to do the weird, are, are going to actually move on to something diametrically opposed to, to the ideas of Lovecraft, uh, while possibly still maintaining some cosmic horror uh, inflection because i really think that's the big challenge in front of us whether people in mass sees it or not is redefining cosmic horror not to erase history i don't think that's useful uh i don't think it's at all useful to to, to erase even the most object you know a, a, a artists who you cause object you know, objection in people but i do think it can't you know for a field to continue to renew itself it cannot always be Poe or Lovecraft or Blackwood 2.0, 3.0. We, we have to do other things. And I think these people, there's a lot of writers up to the task. And so I'm not quite sure what that will look like, but I do think it will be, uh, some of it will be cosmic horror inflected. And I think it will be done consciously to try to move the field forward. Uh, if that's helpful at all. And, and back to the, one last thing, back to the world fantasy bus, I'm actually quite in favor uh, uh, of changing the bus to a more neutral uh, bus. You know, some people are going to hate that. Some people have hated my stance on that. Others, you know, applaud it. I don't, I, I have my opinion. That's that's all there is to it. I don't have a problem with uh, the Lovecraft bus if it, if it were for a Lovecraft, an explicit Lovecraft award. I think, actually, think that would be a fa- fine idea if there was a Lovecraft award. You know, you have, you have the Hugo Award. You have all these different things that are named after people. And I think that's, potentially fraught with with peril but if you're going to do it hey have a lovecraft award but i think it's the world fantasy award and and arguments to the contrary that that he's the face that doesn't necessarily have to be though and the bottom line is we need to be more inclusive and uh i think a chimera or a, the willow tree or whatever gets the point across without alienating every anybody and i say that as a big fan of the how you know the Howie and, and Gahan Wilson in particular. Yeah, what would you think about varying the bust every so often? Anyway, I mean, as you say, it's the World Fantasy Award. It's not tied to any specific author. Is that something that you would be in favor of? Sure, uh, because I have a tendency to think. If it's not called the Shirley Jackson Award, or if it's not called the Hugh, you know, Hugo Gernsback Award, then you don't need to have a specific author. I don't. I, I actually think that it's a mistake, uh, especially. I mean, times have changed. 
it's a mistake uh, to have an author be the face of it or person to be the face of it. I think if it's, if it's, in other words, if it's a neutral award, like the world fantasy neutral in the sense that it doesn't favor a particular author, then you really need to have a neutral, uh, uh, representation symbol, and I, th- I think that easily could change because I'm not making a statement one way or the other about whether the the current uh, configuration is pretty or not pretty or whatever. I think that's immaterial. I'm only speaking to the idea that I I think that while I see both sides of the argument, we really should have a do no harm, and and I think real harm. I I really do think sometimes. Sometimes you can, because people like to, people like to say, well, people are just complaining. I'm like, you know what? But sometimes complaints are complaints and other times they're grievances or, pro, you know, it's a protest. And I don't want, I'm, I don't want to pick on anyone in particular because I don't want to speak for them or say that they would agree with this, but I don't want Cheshire Burke or Victor Laval or uh, Nadia Bolkin or anybody else uh, to basically feel like they have to make some kind of you know, concession if they if they get honored with the World Fantasy Award because it, it it's it's embodied by a a racist. I just don't to me to me the the, the idea that by changing the bus we're going to erase Lovecraft is specious. Yeah, I'm still writing love. I'm still writing Lovecraft stories. I'm still reading him. You can't you couldn't get rid of Lovecraft if you wanted to. So to me it was a it was always a straw man argument. It was a false. You know, it's it's basically a, a fallacy. That it was going to have some kind of negative. They were basically saying "fuck Lovecraft," and I'm not saying that. And, there, and thereby, everybody who likes him. And I'm not saying there aren't people out there on both sides who haven't made asses of themselves because they have, as far as I'm concerned. But I think most people, if you want, if you, if you want to hear something eloquent, far more than I you know, than I'm capable of, you look up David Nickel has spoken uh, at length about this novelist David Nickel and Victor Laval. You can look up his. Uh, we, I actually had the honor of uh, being interviewed by Michael uh, Kaley uh, of Wall Street Journal. Uh, what was it? Year before last, uh, we did an, we did a you know a Wall Street Journal uh, brief podcast, and Victor Laval can he or Laval can uh, speak at length on this with authority. And I don't know, I don't know how anybody could listen to, to what he has to say uh, and, and be on the other side of the of the debate because he is so. Ra- you know, so righteous and rational and so good hearted about the thing. And so, um, even, even handed in it when he doesn't have any obligation to be any of this stuff, you know, and I, I, I really think that, uh, he's, he's one of the guys that, you know, we should be listening to. And of course, David Nickel wrote a really compelling essay about his experiences, even trying to talk about this and how resistant people are to, even i mean it's such an it's considered an attack and i just think that's the wrong way to look at it yeah yeah i agree with you there and i agree regarding victor lavelle who we spoke with last year and we spoke about the ballad of black tom and victor's complicated feelings towards lovecraft as you can imagine i mean you know he he grew up loving his stories and only later found out more about him as a person, and of course through the text. Right. I, I have a, a immense respect. I didn't listen to that. I should listen to that. He's always worth listening to no matter what he's talking. But I was just, when I was sitting in the studio listening to him talk about it, I was it was humbled just by his um, articulate and compassionate and really wise um take on things he really is you know the guy you know victor's together yeah. and i just i just think that i think everybody on both sides man because there's a lot of shrill voices on both sides um and understandably you know i don't i'm not even trying to be cast shade on everybody i'm just he's he's one of the people that we should be listening to because he just is uh has has a lot of intelligent and compassionate things to say about it yeah oh i agree well Brian Asman's final question says, as someone who has previously been placed on a Mount Rushmore of weird fiction in a previous This Is Horror podcast, and for context, that was in the John Padgett podcast, I'm curious to know 
who would be on your Mount Rushmore of weird fiction? <laughs> that's a that's a trap. I I really because it's it's almost it's a good question, but it's very tricky because it's basically it's just basically saying who's your favorite, you know, who do you think the best uh, weird fiction writer is. So I I I'm really loathe to I be specific about I that. I don't know. I don't know if it's saying who's the best. I mean, that's certainly <laughs> one interpretation, but I. I suppose another is like you know what what do you think would be representative? I mean, you're talking about uh, that's being... a, okay. That's a good that's a good question, and I'm gonna uh, you know what I I will essay, but I just uh, with the with a caveat that I know that this could change tomorrow, so I don't you know I I don't uh, I don't think this is authoritative in any way, but just. Off the top of my head, people whom I think are doing representative work, and, and you know, and actually, this is this is there is a way to do this because Gardner Deswall used to talk about it. So did uh, David Hartwell when they did their years best. You, both of them said something to the effect of, "This was the best story that I could afford that an author would send me that I you know that was long enough or short enough to be in the to be in the years best. That these are snapshots. That these aren't." The 20 stories we pick aren't uh, necessarily unequivocally the best. They're simply representative of, of the best work this year. And so right now in our era of riches, I would say uh, Livia Llewellyn, without a doubt, uh, Brian Evanson, John Langan, Gemma Files. If I were going to add one more person, probably Stephen Graham Jones. You know, and I already hate—I already hate myself. But that's th those would be that would be a handful of people who I think are similar but completely different. You know, I, I've called Gemma the Black Flag of of, uh, of of horror and weird fiction, more so for her earlier work. But still, she's extremely subversive, and so is Livia Llewellyn. Those are two extraordinarily subversive uh, writers. Um, obviously, Brian Evanson is just a master, and so is so is Stephen. I kind of pair them up, even though they're they're very different. But there's just something about I think their backgrounds are similar uh, academically and whatnot. John Langan is uh, a chameleon, you know, and, and yeah, he's 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 my uh, dear friend. But I have other dear friends who I didn't just you know toss out. The bo the bottom line is is I think John is arguably maybe doing even maybe the most important work of all of them right now. I I, I think that the fisherman is a legitimately uh, has a potential to be considered a classic in years to come. Uh, and, and the thing is, classic is fraught with, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing that came out last year or whatever. It just means it possesses the requisite elements. I think people are going to be talking about that for many years. Um, you know, uh, you know, I could have also, I could have also added, there's, there's other, there's other people that are great. Nathan Ballingrude, how can you leave, Nathan Ballingrude off a list. Nathan Ballingrude, as far as on the sentence level, I'm not sure any of the people I've mentioned are can match him. He's he's a genius. Dan or Don, uh, Dan Sean uh, is a genius. You know, so, so there's there, there's all these great there's these great writers that are working, but that would be a handful of them that I think are doing the kind of work that we're going to be talking about, and are going to be sort of we're going to look back and go, yeah, that was sort of defining. Uh, the culture of the weird. Mm, yeah. You know, and, and I didn't, and, you know, and the thing is I privileged established, well-established writers. I mean, these are all, everybody I mentioned has been around. If, if I was to add two more, just young, you know, like say one more, one more young writer, I'd say Phil Fricasse, whom I've worked with and watched him grow. And, uh, his debut collection, you know, it's just, it's a, it's a work of genius. Him and John Padgett, you've had John on here. I mean, I just, you know, and either one of our young guys, this is, this is an interesting trend that I'm seeing. Scott Nicolay, same thing. These guys are actually my age or older, which means, you know, they're getting old. And, um, you know, these are, these are their, <laughs> these are their first books. I just, it's, uh, it's, it's incredible to me, you know, what's going on in the field. Somebody asked me the other day, they said, well, you said in an essay a few years ago that you thought in 2015, that you thought we were, you know, on the ascent. Do you still feel that? Or do you think we're declining? And I'm like, I don't know how you could come to a conclusion that we're declining when if you're not given free books by the box load, you can't keep, unless you're independently wealthy and ha don't have to work, 
I don't know how you could possibly keep up with even the slice of genre that is the, uh, you know, the razor thin slice. That's the weird. Mm. I don't know how you could keep up with it. And so we're not, you know, I, I think there's ebb, there's ebb and flow as far as like impact stuff coming out. But right now I'm seeing movies being made of the weird fiction. I'm seeing great books coming out every year. There's a, at least a handful of commercial books that are being lauded. Paul Tremblay, another, another guy I could have put on there easily. Uh, the, the the bottom line is I think we're in a really good place. I'm I'm super excited about it. I'm and I'm kind of glad that I'm able to just. I feel like I got to get back to doing you know more short fiction because I feel inspired to to help contribute. That's how good it is. Mm -hmm. Well, our final Patreon question is from Dan Howarth, and he says, "All writers must read a lot and write a lot." How critical are you when you read a novel? Can you ever detach and read for fun? Or are you always looking for writing pointers when you read a book? Well, I, I don't know. This is something that I've, I can only say about myself. It, there's sort of this evolution that has occurred with me. I, I, I actually, the analog would be um, martial arts. I took martial arts for many years and I, I, I studied it assiduously just like I do writing. I mean, it was what I did for a few years. That's all I cared about uh, when I first moved to Seattle, as a matter of fact. And there's this interesting syndrome. I didn't succumb to it because I already had my teeth kicked in plenty, finding out that I wasn't all that racing dogs. Um, the bottom line is, you know, co you know competitively, the, the bottom line is, though, a lot of people go through the whole, you know, just enough to be dangerous syndrome. And... And I find writings that way too. I think also first or second year psych students succumb to this a lot. You try to diagnose everybody. Everybody's an editor that's that that, that has taken some writing classes, and I and I was uh, to some degree. I had to fight to to turn that off. Uh, these days, I have no problem uh, reading for fun. While one part of my mind is like, oh, there's a typo, or ooh, that would be better if it's it's manageable, so I actually can enjoy stuff. The, the one thing that has happened for me, though, is that I'm, I'm kind of relentlessly unforgiving about stuff. In other words, I won't read past a few. I've got slush. I've got slush pile uh, sort of mentality. If you don't hook me, if, if I don't think the book, uh, the writing is very good, you only have about a page to get me to get me. And so if you don't, everybody talks about, oh, I, I gave it 50 pages. I don't give it 50 pages. I give you about 30 seconds. If you, if you cannot, if I can't flip to a random page. And I don't have, I'm not talking about plot or narrative or thematic structure, all this stuff. I'm talking about, can you put a fucking sentence together that makes me want to read the next fucking sentence? If you can't do that on any page, then I'm not reading it unless I have to, unless I have to review it or something like that, you know? Uh, and so I find though, so that, so that's the, that is the one thing that I do carry with me is I have absolutely no, no time for stuff that d doesn't, uh, that doesn't doesn't attract me right away. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and I kind of take a similar approach because I think there's so much great art out there, whether it's films, whether it's TV shows, whether it's books. That life is simply too short for me to read something that I'm not enjoying or that I don't think is very good. Well, the, the I right, and the only exception I make to that is if I'm because I do mentor, uh, I try to have one or two authors that I'm occasionally mentoring at any given time. Um, I feel like that's a, something that I owe, that I should do that. And so, yeah, obviously, it doesn't matter what, what's going on. I'll read the whole thing and, 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 and give, give the feedback. Uh, the other exception is if it's a younger author, newer author, I will give them, you know, and the book comes out, and I have reason to believe that it might be a good book, I will occasionally, you know, try to, try to battle through it but yeah and i've never been you know what i have i've yet to, to to kick myself over over that philosophy i because here's the thing i i picked it up years ago i forget who it was probably peter straub you can pick up a peter straub novel and flip flip to anywhere in the book and go okay this is good writing you you may not know whether it holds together uh plot wise you know it's very easy you know it's very possible that it, that you might pick up something that's beautifully written but isn't isn't a good book and, I, and that, that can happen. But uh, Stuart O'Nan was another one. I, you know, I could pick up a Stuart O'Nan book and just flip to a random page and go, this is good writing. 
and that's what I demand. I, I don't, you know, I may think it's good writing and then get halfway through and go, okay, yep, plot isn't worth it. But that's fine. That's time well spent. I just, if, if the writing, if you cannot pass the fundamental smell test for the writing, then I'm not going to read, I'm not going to read it. And that's just all there is to it. And so I suppose that's an outgrowth of the internal, you know, the editor. But I, but, but, but I've loved lots of stuff that I think needed to have a, 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 another round of edits. I, I don't let that ruin my, I don't let that ruin my uh, enjoyment of, of a book. Oh yeah, I mean it's definitely possible to enjoy something and also think that it's flawed or notice some errors, but you know the key is that the enjoyment is outweighing that. Exactly. Yeah, you know, at least when you're reading for pleasure rather than reading as a beta reader or to give someone feedback. Like, right. I mean, obviously, if I'm reading to give someone feedback and I don't enjoy the first two sentences, I don't email them back and say, I'm very sorry, <laughs> I didn't enjoy that. So, you know, send send me some sentences I do enjoy and I'll look again. <laughs> <laughs> I, may, I may have to actually try that and see what they do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> send me more sentences and better ones. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well... We've been chatting for over three hours now, and we'll definitely have to get you back on the podcast nearer the release of your crime novel, Blood Standard. So, with that said, where can our listeners connect with you? You can get me um, on Facebook under Laird Barron, uh, Twitter, Laird Barron, uh, no fancy handle, and you can also... Uh, visit my author, my official author site, which is uh, Laird Barron at WordPress.com. Okay, and do you have any final thoughts that you'd like to leave our listeners with? No, I, I just would like to say to the, the subscribers, uh, thank you for the great questions. And uh, I appreciate uh, the opportunity and format to go into depth answering these questions. It's a great show. Yeah. Thank you very much for taking the time, for taking the majority of your evening chatting with us. That's my pleasure. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much for listening to our interview with Laird Barron. In the next week, we've got some exciting episodes coming up. We've got a two-part conversation with Anthony Johnston. He is the writer of Dead Space, the popular video game, and The Coldest City, which was recently adapted into the Charlie Theron film, Atomic Blonde. And we also have a very special edition of Story Unboxed, where we're joined by Max Booth of Castle Rock Radio, where we talk about and celebrate the life of Dallas Mayer, better known to many as Jack Ketchum, and we unbox his short story, The Box. Now, ordinarily, Story Unboxed is reserved for our patrons, but this is an episode that is going out to everyone. I mean, sharing Jack Ketchum's work is far too important, so you're all going to get that. Of course, if you want to get story unboxed generally if you like what we do if you like us digging into the craft of writing then you can support us on patreon and at the three dollar level you get access to our story craft podcast story unboxed a horror podcast on the craft of writing and last week we unboxed not from around here by david j scow of course, when you are a patron, you get to submit questions for the guest. You get to vote on the direction that the This Is Horror podcast is going in. And perhaps most importantly, you get to be part of a community and you get to keep the podcast alive. Now, if you're a regular listener, you'll know that by January 2020, my aim is for the This Is Horror podcast Patreon to have 1,000 patrons, which... Given we're on 109 at the time of recording, is pretty ambitious, but we've had a lot of people recently sign up, and it is my belief that there are a thousand people who would like to be patrons of the This Is Horror podcast who would get tremendous value out of that. I just don't think that every one of those 1,000 people is even aware of the This Is Horror podcast yet, so... 
please spread the word. Tell people about the podcast. Write us a review on iTunes. That will help in terms of our visibility, in terms of getting us up the charts. We're getting near 50 reviews on iTunes USA. We're at 42 at the moment. I would love it, absolutely love it, if you could leave us a review. And I would love it if you could become a This Is Horror Podcast patron. One dollar is all it takes. www.patreon.com forward slash this is horror. Okay, to wrap up, let's have a word from our sponsors. Do you like Stephen King? Do you like podcasts of Stephen King? Do you like spooky magazines? Good news! Now you can have a Stephen King podcast, Castle Rock Radio. And you can have a spooky magazine, Dark Moon Digest. All you have to do, go to www.patreon.com slash PMM Publishing. Have a scary day! Okay, the second sponsor is Audible. Head over to www.audibletrial forward slash this is horror and choose a free audiobook and 30 day trial. Even at the end of the trial, you get to keep the audiobook, so it is win win. And the audiobook that I recommend this week is Closing Time by Jack Ketchum. As always, I would like to end the episode with a quote, and once again, this is from Jack Ketchum. Jack had so much to share with the world and this is another one of those pieces of advice that I think is going to be absolutely invaluable. I figure if I don't scare myself, if I don't feel that dread of what's coming up next, I probably won't scare you. But the same is true of any emotion or feeling I try to get down right on the page. If I'm doing comedy, I damn well better make myself laugh. If I'm doing tenderness, I want to feel that too. I want to bleed a little. That way, the feeling comes through to you. That was Jack Ketchum. If you haven't, please, please read Jack Ketchum. Off Season, The Girl Next Door, The Short Story, The Box. So much great work. I'll see you in the next episode. Until then, look after yourself, be good to one another, read horror, and have a great, great day. We are now towards the end of the questions, by the way. They're not, it's not just like an yeah. infinite pool of questions. Only 20 more to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>